in a few seconds. Um, Carl, so thankfully, has so I'm, funny. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. I'm just going to try mm. and find, I know Gemma's online, but I want to be able to spotlight her so I can find her easily. When we, um, here we go, hang on a second. So. And I think that pins it. Okay, that works. Right. Um, speak of you. Let's just admit someone and I've got Gem there. Perfect. Okay, so welcome everyone. It's um, really wonderful to be here again uh, for a guy in a speaks on a very different theme. We don't normally veer into uh, this kind of area because we're normally kind of doing arts or cultural history. So, um, but yeah, Rod and I were just having a chat and we thought there's so many brilliant um, entrepreneurs. And so we just thought we'd start with the three that we're very familiar with. So it's, it was kind of a pot, you know, we just, yeah, there are a lot we know, but of course we know Patrice because uh, Patrice has, um, uh, actually, we, I can't remember what, Patrice, did we meet you at uh, the Classic? Was that when we first met you? No, Folk Festival. Uh, the folk festival that was it. Yeah, the folk yeah. festival, yeah, and yeah. of course we've known Mark Dalgetty a long time, especially um, Rod via um, Gay uh, QC yeah, and um, uh, the alumni, and of course uh, Auntie Jem. I believe everybody knows Auntie Jem. I was very lucky to meet Auntie Jem on my first visit to Guyana, um, Jem Jem Isol, and. Um, as it happens, my brother's wife um, is also related to the idol. So uh, Kate's online, Auntie Jem, just so that you know. <laughs> Kate, Kate's joined so that she can she can hear you as well. And Hello. Aunt, Auntie Jem, can you unmute? Aunt, Auntie Jem, I can I can see where you are, but you're currently on. Let me see if I. Oh, there you go, there you go. So Kate, you can say hello to your auntie, Auntie Jem. <laughs> hello, Aunt Jem. Um, greetings, hello. greetings from Guyana. Greetings from Kensington, London. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're well. well. I must thank Juanita, Rod, and the team for inviting me this morning. It's, it's really, really wonderful to see you, uh, uh, Auntie Jam. I haven't, I know Rod's been speaking to you um, on, on, on a few occasions. I've unfortunately been stuck at work. I've got, anyway, I'm not going to bore you with my work, but I've had so much going on. I, I didn't have a chance to uh, talk to you beforehand, but it's lovely to see, see you, <laughs> really see you. And, and of course, um, I, I, I will always be indebted to Auntie Jam because uh, she was really the person that, kind of introduced me to Guyana in a way because via Auntie Jem I then met a lot of um, um, people from Bishop's High School and we went traveling around Guyana and, and that was fantastic. So I think um, I won't worry with introductions today because we had all the introductions were on the um, Eventbrite link so everybody will know who everyone is. Um, and you'll know that Auntie Jam is the um, owner of Frandex. Sorry, I keep saying Auntie Jam. I'm going to call it Jem Eitel so that you know, um, have her full name there. So Jem Eitel, who's the owner and a manager of um, Frandex Travel. Um, and, you know, Auntie Jem, you sent actually a really interesting um, few notes through to me. And so I'm, I'm slightly confused in my head as to how I'm going to do this because I'm absolutely fascinated by the notes you sent me on the early days of travel in Guyana. Um, but, um, and I'm definitely gonna go there, but my first question I think to you is, you know, as a child growing up in Guyana, um, of course you were part of a large loving Guyanese family. Can you describe to me two family members that had the most um, influence on you and the places that you would visit together? And, you know, presumably, would you go on holiday in Guyana when you were, when you were a child? Well, growing up in Guyana, I, my parents, Archie and Jane, us up as a lovely family. 
My mother every August always took us on one day train trip, train rides. Uh, Auntie Jen, take, Auntie Jen, can I just ask taking you? The, taking the George Stang. Auntie Jem, sorry to interrupt you, but we can't George quite... Auntie Jem, bear with me. We can't quite see your face. Could you put, could you line up the, um, is it your phone or your laptop so that we can see you? We just want to make sure that we can see you a bit better. Okay. Yes, that's perfect. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So we start from the beginning. Tell us, tell us all about your family again. Okay. You want me to start over? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh -huh. Oh, you're moving. You're moving the camera yeah, out of the way again. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, can you know, you, I'm not can you adjust it? To this. I don't know about this modern technology, you know. Okay. All right. Well, don't worry. Go go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. My parents influenced me and brought us up as a loving family. My mother, every August, always took us on one day train rides, taking the Georgetown Rosignol. Train at 8 a.m., disembarking at one of the East Coast villages like Clonbrook or Belfield. Then we would picnic on the beach and after walk around the villages before going back to the station for the return to Georgetown at 6 p.m. The same exercise went on on the West Coast. Ferry to Freedenhoek and train to Parika disembarking at Leonora or Tushin or one of those other estates. My five childhood days in traveling around, those days were called knowing your country. Now it is called tourism. From these early trips, my parents made we, after from the early days trips with my parents. When I became a teenager, I went on several overland trips to the interior with Miss Madge Rockcliffe, a well-known school teacher and a commercial teacher that is shorthand and typewriting. We went everywhere from 63 Beach, 63 Beach on the quarantine to study on the Esquibu, in the Esquibu. When we went to Lake Kapui and Itarabisi, which was a hot and cold lake, went to the Essequibo Islands, Wakenham, Leguan, Fort Island, and the little villages along the Essequibo River. And last, but then we went to the Essequibo Islands, Wakenham, Leguan. Fort Island, which was once the capital of Guyana, where it where now stands and it's still there, the court of policy. And it is very well kept and it is one of the main tourist attractions in Guyana. As a fun fact, it used to be called Eitel Island, as most of that island was owned by the family and everyone was related. Miss Rock. Cliff took many overland trips to Kaichu. First to Mackenzie by boat on the RH car, overnighted there. Then the next morning, over to Whistler or for Rockstone to start on the trail by lorry to Kangaroo. Kangaroo. Then cross the Denham Suspension Bridge which is still there and very well kept. And it was, this bridge was named after the governor at the time. And then up the Patara River to Tukai, at the foot of the falls, then to Amatuk and Waratuk Falls. Then the trek up to the Grand Kaicho. Slept overnight on the plateau, and the next day trekked down to Kaicho. Kangaroo to Bartik of 
returning by boat to Stabroke Market selling. All these trips were done by engine and paddle boats. There were no speed boats, no speed engines, and no safety jackets, as they call them now. Then up the Demerara River to the tributaries, the most popular was Comuni Creek, which took us to Santa Mission, an Amerindian village, most popular for cassava products, particularly the potent pure, Paiwari drink. Anything else you'd like me to say on question one? Sorry, I realized I was on mute. Um, so I just wanted, about to, wanted to know what, know. yeah. <laughs> Auntie Jam, can you hear? I just wanted to um, ask you, what year are you talking about? What period is this? So when you mentioned Miss Rockcliffe, what is this during your school days? As a female civil servant, There is a cam. Uh, Auntie, Auntie Jam. So my question was, uh, what year are you referring to? And also well, you mentioned Miss Rockcliffe. So I just wanted to know um, what period you were talking about. In the early 50s. In the early Before 50s. Before I was married. Okay. And so all the, all the um, travel was by paddle boat. Oh my gosh. Okay, Auntie, Auntie Jam, I tell you what, shall we go on to the next question? If you can hear me, Auntie Jam. Go on to the next question. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the next question is... All right. I'll, you, you, I'll, just, I'll just present the question so that the audience can hear it. So the question was, you married your late husband in 1954 at a time when very few women were in the civil service. And consequently, you joined the private sector a year later. Um, my understanding is that you joined the firm Francis de Carey's and Company. Um, can you tell us about those initial days? Okay, as a, as a female civil servant, I had to resign when I got married in November 1954, as, civil, as a civil service never employed married women. In January 1955, I joined Francis Carey's and Company, a commission and insurance agency owned by Cecil Carey's. In 1958, he decided to change his status to a limited liability company, where he was chairman with W.G. Stull, Commissioner of Inland Revenue, W. Lloyd Wilson, a chartered accountant and auditor, and Darcy Gold, one of his principals from Trinidad as directors. Cecil de Carey's did a lot of traveling and his arrangements were handled by Neela Choshinam, who worked at British Guiana Airways, founded by Harry Rent and Art Williams in 1939. In 1960, she jogged jokingly told him to open an independent travel agency and employer to manage it. He readily agreed and between them they got the ball rolling. In looking for a name for the agency, the Trinidadian director told us to use the cable address Friday. You know in those days we didn't have internet and and all of that. So you used to communicate by cable and you had to have a cable address and which was friendly. Then in September 1960, we opened the door as Guyana's first independent travel agency. We got IATA status in February 1961. And there has been no turning back after that. Anything else you'd like to find out about that, that era? 
Um, no, I, what I'm going to do is I'll come back to that at, at the end. But I, oh, okay. I just wondered if you could um, just describe the genesis of Frandec and, um, you know, other business ventures and why you were so drawn to establishing that company. Hmm? Oh. Auntie Jem, you're currently on mute. Auntie Jam, you're, you're on mute. If you could unmute yourself. Let me just see if I could do it. Hold on. Wonderful. We can hear you now. Why was, why was, I was always drawn to Frandek because it was more than just one thing in the community. Frandek provided more than just booking flights. We were all in the early days, it was a commission agency for products such as men's ties, Polania shoes, hats, haberdashery, notions, and was one of the first importers of photocopying machine. It's called SCM. Then the aspect of the insurance company. The insurance section, the health insurance aspect of the business growth of its growth of its insurance business. We represented companies such as North American Life, Home Insurance, Calico, Lloyd's of London, Crawford Beck and Amos. And through those companies, we did the life insurance group insurance, health insurance, travel insurance, workman's compensation insurance, you named it, we covered it. Then in 1960, when the laws were being revised, we the insurance companies we represented overseas were being asked to invest thousands of dollars, $250,000, and they in, in, put it into the insurance, to the Bank of Guyana. And they objected and they all um, ceased operations in Guyana. And the health insurance section did not come into that category. And so we kept the health insurance, called it Randic, and moved on from there. Then we had a, we opened a business center, which provided more services from visa application assistance to printing, photocopying, binding, and other necessary administrative supportive services. Then out of Frandec, overseas travel, if you stated, local tours for visitors to explore Guyana. It was Frandec's ability to respond to various, to the varying needs of the community. In the office, we, also, we, had a, we had a desk for inland tours. It was called Wilderness Explorers by Tony Thorne, who was one of the first, first persons to start these inland, I think. 
he might have been the first or there might have been more, but we had an office with him in our office. He had a, where you could book the interior flights to go to Kaichor and Orenduk and in those days we didn't have Baganar and Arrow Point and Shanklands. Mm. Thank you for that, um, Auntie Jam. So um, the next question I had down was, I think I was interested in sort of thinking about the travel to and from Guyana um, when you entered the employ of De Carries, um, cause I know it was primarily by ship. Um, and I wanted to know as travel demands increased pre and post political turmoil in the nation and air travel began to emerge as a, ma a, a major player, would it be possible to just create a picture in our minds as to what the atmosphere would have been like at um, Atkinson Field? You know, whenever a, a family member departed the country, was it a big thing to then be flying from Atkinson Field? Well, well, Charlton from Guyana, when, okay, generally people would travel by small, people would travel by small planes to Trinidad and the islands or go to Trinidad to join some of the cruise ships, primarily to England. Some used to come here, the Willemstad and the Randestad, which were the Dutch boats, and they had boats from the Antilles, Duke de Maul, and I can't remember all the names right now. Travel to North America, then grew in leaps. When travel to North America grew in leaps and bounds. As regards the travel in the early days, steamships were preferred as civil servants were entitled to six months vacation leave every four or three years, depending on your status in the service. Some with passages paid and the leave started when you arrived in the country of your vacation, which was usually UK and ended when you left the UK. The Dutch boats sailed for 21 days and the French are about between 14 and 16. So in all, one got seven months leave if you left the country by boat. BWIA played an important part in the history of the travel industry, operating in and out of Guyana since 1948. When the mass migration started in the early 60s and there was no visa requirement to go to the United Kingdom, the one-way fare was $406, a lot of money in those days. Atkinson Field was the airport, a small wooden building and going away was a major event whenever a family or community member was leaving the country. Persons leaving were generally dressed up, some, some with hats, and the famous brick. It was an outing to go to the airport, all dressed up in our Sunday best to wave goodbye and to get a Kodak picture to record this big, this big event. Car loads, even bus loads would come. Some persons would go to the Redwater Creek or Louis, or Louis Chung's Creek, which is now called the, the Cara, to complete the outing. 
So, um, Auntie Jen, for those who don't know um, Louis Chung's Creek, is that next to the Atkinson's Field? Was it a place that you would then go after you'd said goodbye to the family? Repeat that for me, please. I, I heard you mention Louis Chung's Creek, and I wondered, is that next oh. to the Atkinson's Airfield? Auntie Jem, you're on mute again. I'm just going to try and unmute. Okay. Yeah, it's now called the Cara Creek. Everybody uh, is there now, and on us on Sundays, and so that is uh, quite quite um, a tourist attraction, the Cara Creek. Yes. Okay, so it, it's it's uh, I can see a few people nodding their heads. They remember the good old days. I can see Carl especially. <laughs> Everybody dressed up and, re and ready to travel. The the other thing, actually, um, Auntie Jen, that I'd love you to talk about was you'd mentioned um, I think when you were speaking to Rod about um, Sandbatch Parker and Co. And I think you'd mentioned they were one of the oldest companies operating in. Um, British Guyana because they, they were established in 1782 and were the first to sell um, travel tickets to passengers traveling on steamships. So I'm wondering if you could just say a bit more about that, that um, you know, the travel in, in the early days with Sam Batch Parker as, as a travel bureau. What do you want to do? What do you want me to do? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Aunt, Auntie Jam. Could you repeat your question? Yes. So, do you remember you sent us um, a, 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 a a piece about the early days of travel in Guyana. And I thought it was very interesting because you had mentioned in this piece about Sam Batch Parker and Co. And you said that they were one of the oldest companies operating in Guyana, having been established in 1782. So I just wondered if you could say more about that period of, of history, because, um, you know, Sam Batch Parker, I, they, when they started in 1782, they had, uh, they actually started having ships that would go between Africa and Guyana slave ships. And then, um, and then when, during the period of indentureship, they had ships for indentureship. And I just thought it was fascinating. I hadn't realized that they then, um, you know, after emancipation and after indentureship, they had steamships. So um, I wondered if you could just say something about the early days when Sam Batch Parker first had their travel bureau. Africa, Africa. Oh no, we didn't. So. Um, Auntie Gemma, it was the piece that's headed early days, Guyana travel history. Um, you sent that to Rod and um, it talks about the Sandbatch Travel Bureau and also um, Art J. Williams and Harry. I know you mentioned Art J. Williams and Henry went earlier, but I just wondered if you could say a bit more about Sandbatch Parker. And then when, when you're ready and you, you, you just um, unmute. All right, I going to Africa. You had to go via the United Kingdom. We, we didn't do traveling those days to Africa. 
and they couldn't of, people couldn't afford, and there were there were really no connections with Africa. And as regards Samaj Parker, I don't know much about Samaj Parker. I will have to get more details and that perhaps I mail it to you. Okay. You All might right. have to do it and find out about Samaj Parker. Yes, I okay. Know, I know it's Prostons was, I think it was Prostons that was established here in 1798 or something like that. I, 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 is more than history to me. Yes, yeah. I was I would, never involved with Sandwich Park and Sprostons and Wheaton and Rickton. There was uh, other places. I I I concentrated on Francis Securities and Company and Brandy. Okay, okay. No, that's fine. I just saw that they had um later morphed into KLM. And I just thought it was really interesting that their history started from 1782 and then it, it, um, they're now KLM. But anyway, let's go to the next question. So number five, um, many within the diaspora may be considering returning to Guyana to live, perhaps to open a business or simply to retire. As the matriarch of the insurance industry in Guyana, what advice would you um, offer them? And you, you'd need to unmute. All right, now to add for your question number five. Yes. As in Guyana. Just ask them to be patient. Oh, they're, they're patient, don't worry. <laughs> Guyana, is, Guyana is in many ways just the same. With the same old vibes, the same old people, and the very good food. However, there are many differences between your life in the, in the diaspora and our life in Guyana. Just remember it is still home and that is indescribable and irreplaceable. Thanks, thanks for that. And so That's finally- great. We are getting there, we are coming up, we are coming up, but it will take time. We can see you well now. I it's love your dress, come, by the way. And then come from the top. Times have changed. Yeah. And lifestyles. So it's a diff it's difficult to transition back to but Guyana. It's the, same old, it's the same old Guyana. It's the same. Okay. Okay. So I the just I wanted... love. Yes. <laughs> um I think we all we all love our memories of Guyana. Um what what I wanted to finally ask you, um, your company Frandec is um the well, Rod has it here, is the first and the longest serving travel agency in Guyana, is that correct? And with the majority of travelers now using the internet to make travel arrangements, what do you predict for the future of independent travel agencies? That's question six. Oh, well, there will always be a place for an independent travel agency. There will be consistently corporate clients who have multiple people who need the logistical support of agencies. However, with the pandemic and the travel slowly becoming, and the travel slowly coming back, people are looking for support and travel again. There are many who prefer the convenience of not having to do the searches themselves and also the personalized touch of knowing there is someone taking care of your travel life, someone to troubleshoot when everything goes here. Thank you so much, um, Auntie Chan. Particularly, thank you for giving us a, a good understanding of your, your business as well, Frandek and the genesis of it. Um, I, I just want to ask Tamisha, if Tamisha is it, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Tamisha Eitel. I, I heard from somebody that Auntie Jem's got a birthday coming up soon. 
Oh, um, hi, it's Tamarisha. There will be no camera since it's early. Uh, okay. She just celebrated her 90th birthday. Wow. <laughs> so and zero. And so her and this technology are very far forward for her. I, her I have to Way take the game. I have to, I have to whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> that is so impressive. Auntie Jem, happy birthday. And thank you so, so much um, for that okay. wonderful. Um, I, must thank, I must thank you for inviting me. And well, I hope I have been able to give you the answers to the questions you have been asking me. Yes, yes, and we're we're deeply honoured to have you, Auntie Jem, and um, and right. deeply, if, if there, if and there, deeply uh, impressed. If there, are any, if there are any other questions, please email me, and I will email them to you. Okay, perfect. You know, at age ninety, you must have something to remind you that you're getting on in years, and you have to slow down. <laughs> well, one of my problem is. I'm a little hard of hearing, as the Guyanese would say. <laughs> well, I have to it's say, a little, I, have a, I have a hearing problem. Yes, but you know, Auntie Jam, it's it's never easy anyway doing um, zooms with Guyana because quite often there's a lot of noise interference. So you did fantastically well, and um, we really enjoyed you sharing those stories with us. And you look fabulous as always. So thank you. Miss Cox, before you log off, can we say hello to Aunt Jem, those of us who are her family? Aunt Jem, can you hear me? This is Michael. Okay, Michael. thank you, thank you for your compliment. You look fabulous for 90. And thank I hope you. to come and visit you soon in Guyana. I have some other people. I think um, Jennifer wants to come down and we will all come over. We'll let you know, of course, and we'll all come over and see you and hug you and kiss you. Any anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Auntie Jam, it's Alison Tyndall. Haven't seen you for so so long. You look wonderful. Oh. I hope you have a I hope you have a nice day in London. We have yes. a sultry day here. Thank you. Hi, Auntie Jam. You know, I'm sure you have the Olympics to keep you occupied, and we are looking forward to the cricket this coming weekend. Hi, Auntie Jam is great. Oh, between between the uh, Auntie Jam, Greer was just saying hello. <laughs> hearing anything? Uh, no. <laughs> hey, hey, yes. Yes. Probably need to unmute their mics. Hi, Auntie Jam. Well, the technology is baffling all of us, <laughs> but it's really a great pleasure. It's really a great, great pleasure to see Auntie Jem. And um, I hope you heard that Greer Westmus was also online trying to say hello and happy birthday to you. Yes. Ken Corsby, Ken Corsby. And also Ken Corsby. Yeah. yeah. And me, Alison Tindall. And Alison Tindall. So um, I don't know who's helping you with the Zoom, but maybe they could show you everybody who's online, because I know a lot of people are joined today, especially to be able to see you. And um, we've got lots of wonderful messages in the um, chat. Okay, Ken Corsby. Um, Ken, course, yeah, where is Ken? Ken has a birthday. Today is what, the 25th? Yes, birthday is 27. Yeah. Ni 91 today. <laughs> Anyhow, oh, happy yeah. birthday. I tried to say hello to Ken on his birthday. Yes. Ken, happy birthday happy to you birthday. too. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, dear. Uh, Ken, can we start love? <laughs> What's that? There's all that love. Oh, she's saying you can't miss that laugh, but I think that laugh was probably my laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yes, yes. I hope so. I hope I hope you all will be able to send this video this to Daphne. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because I have to call her to help to jog my memory. 
yes, yes absolutely it's, we'll send it to her i know kate kate um you mean daphne raymond yeah. who was daphne, daphne Eitel? Eitel. yeah daphne Eitel. yeah yeah so kate is online maybe kate can say get it as well. mm -hmm. i'm online yes if uh, Juanita, if you can give me a recording because I haven't recorded it. No, that's you, fine. Yeah, then I can show it to her. I can play it to her. Okay. I when will. you know when she when she's awake. <laughs> okay. Okay. All Thanks. right. Perfect. All sorted. So I think everyone said hello. <laughs> um, and we're gonna, uh, um, Auntie Jen, we're gonna move on now. So I'm going to say thank you so much. And then we're going to talk now to Patrice Hines. So thank you. And don't go anywhere in case people have questions. Um, but um, here we go. We have Patrice. And I'm just going to spotlight you so that, uh, where's Patrice gone? Here we go. Spotlight you. There you go. Hello. Hello, hello. So you're actually back in England because we haven't yeah. seen you forever on these shores. <laughs> I'm in Guyana. I'm still in Guyana. You're still in Guyana. Oh, my gosh. Jealous. Going on, going on to 16 months now. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I know. Well, I should have known that from the air, uh, from the uh, surroundings, because those bricks are not British, <laughs> British looking bricks. Yeah, that's exactly. G that's GT, GT bricks. GT bricks. That's right. <laughs> So Patrice, welcome. So what I wanted to ask you starting off, um, yeah. growing up in Lewisham, South London, yeah. you were living in a very diverse community and other Guyanese in particular have called Lewisham home. So from the late mayor of Lewisham, who was Les Eitel, cousin to Jem uh, Eitel's late husband, to the current MP, Janet Dabby, could you describe a typical gathering in the Heinz household, including your mother Pinky and others that played a part in your upbringing? Okay, um, well, I'll, I'll give you a, a classic kind of gathering. First things first, um, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning from me. Um, in the days of me growing up in like the 70s and early 80s, it was, it was as if it was like a circuit every Saturday you'll be going around to one of your aunt's uncle's houses because it would be their gathering. And then it'd be, you'll see your cousins and everything like that. So it was kind of a, a very close community. Um, but to highlight a gathering, highlight a, a gathering in a house, in the, in the Heinz household. Well, first the smell was the beginning of knowing full well that we got a big old party going on on Saturday. Um, and mum would be kind of communicating with aunts of the different dishes that would be cooked. And it was like a, a, a super classic all the way from kind of like the prunes with the, 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 the um, <laughs> peanut butter, the peanut butter in it, down to the, 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 the uh, pineapple and cheese, down to cheese straws, down to Guyanese patties, just like all the hits, you know? So as kids, we were banished to be upstairs and you used to come downstairs to kind of get your food and catch yourself back upstairs. But um, obviously coming downstairs, it was just amazing seeing kind of all your aunts and uncles kind of literally having a good old time. Because in those days, they, they were working like six days, seven days a week, but found it really important to still party on a Saturday um, and then go to the do the shift on the Sunday in that respect there. So that's kind of some of the things that I remember, just literally surrounded by lots of love and family and friends and um, some serious eating and some serious rum drinking from the elders. You're literally making my mouth water. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me something as well about the drinks. I mean, what, what do, do they make the homemade drinks and things like that? Is that a piano in the background? I don't know who, who where that noise is coming from. <laughs> can whoever has their... Um, Hang on, let me just see if I can I can switch this off because I have no idea where that's coming from. Thank me. Um, okay, I think it's gone now. Yes, carry on. There you go. Well, um, in the olden days, because obviously I've been in, now in Guyana like fifteen, going on to sixteen months. So 
I've literally been doing lots of kind of talking with my father and lots of recording of interviews for other things we're going to be doing, but more importantly, to have an understanding of who he is and what our family was about. And he used to call it like the poor days. So this is me being pre me being born. And literally they would have kind of like these, it, you know, it call it blues dances, where literally money was coming in for whoever was having the dance at that time there to be able to pay their rent or to pay some bills and that kind of stuff. But it used to be, I think he said it's like one and six parties. So everything was one and six. The snap glass of um, kind of fortified wine, because nobody could really have big shelf whiskeys at that time there because it was the poor days. Um, but it seems like they just had the most amazing time. But um, in, in my existence of family gathering parties, it was what was there not to drink. Uh, my, my dad kind of ran the bar very well, very professionally. So everybody was just having a, a whale of a time, just, you know, literally all night, morning breakfast. It could be pepper pot as breakfast, bacon, salt fish at breakfast, um, sauce, obviously. Um, some more black pudding. No, 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 stop, 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 stop. <laughs> you understand why I'm in the food business. Oh, stop. <laughs> oh, gosh. Can you paint a picture, if you will, um, of Pinky? Like, what was her full name? And where in Guyana was she born? Yeah. And what influenced her most when she was in the kitchen? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, my mum is Gwendolyn Barbara Hines. Um, AKA Pinky, because she had the most amazing rosy cheeks. And um, she was, she's passed away this year, 36 years ago, um, which always kind of, when I say it, kind of, I can't believe how long she's kind of gone. But she was the glue of all of our family in the UK, in Guyana, in America, everything kind of revolved around Auntie Pinky in that way there. So literally it was just a, a wonderful time of her existence being around and she's left an amazing mark still up to today. Um, but literally you hadn't even finished eating and you just knew whatever was coming next was gonna be fantastic. She just, cooking was easy for her. Just, she had the flavor. It's, it's uh, up to now, I can't believe what she used to kind of put together. Just amazing stuff. Yeah, one of the best cooks in the world as far as I'm concerned. Where, where, where in Guyana was she born? Um, born was in Georgetown, but oh, she's um, in Georgetown. yeah, yeah, but um, okay. grew up, brought up in Agricola on the East Bank um, with my grandmother, Mama, and brothers and sisters, and that kind of stuff. I've been coming to Guyana since I've been 18 months of age, so literally, I know the mud well. Yeah, fantastic. So, when did you um, make the decision to harness all the knowledge you'd acquired growing up and yeah. turn it into a full time occupation? Okay, well, um, I've never really had a job. I've always kind of run my own businesses since uh, a kid. And about 2013, I realized I hadn't gone to come back to Guyana for about six, seven years, because dad and my um, stepmom always used to come over. So there's so many other places in the world to check. But when I came over in 2013 and I had a really good time, he said, son, did you enjoy yourself? And I was like, I'll see you in six months. Um, because it was some, something happened that I didn't know what it was, but it was like, I need to be coming back to Guyana much more often. One of them was to make sure that himself and my stepmom were kind of doing well. Um, but, you know, it started in 2013. And when I came back um, the second half, I literally took off my holiday glasses and put on my business glasses and just started tuning in to what I knew I didn't know what it would be, but there's an opportunity going on with all the skill sets that I've built up in all my businesses for something. So what, what, what actually, um, can you briefly tell us what is the process like to go from conception to creation? Okay, um, well, I've been doing it all, all my life. So um, I kind of really kind of work from what I want the outcome to be first. And uh, for me, the opportunity that I found was that nobody really knows if they're not Guyanese or they're married to a Guyanese person or they've got Guyanese friends. Nobody knows anything about Guyana, usually Ghana in that way there. And I realized that we really have some really basic things over here. One of them starts with food, the second's food, the third's food. We take it so seriously, it's kind of a bit, bit crazy. What, 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 what I see, but what I really saw was 
other than it being represented in our communities, brilliant. I didn't see it kind of outside of the community. Um, so my brain was just trying to work out how can I do something authentically that can speak to my people as well as people that haven't got a clue that might be based in Somerset. Fantastic. So, but so can I just get a sense? You're saying that you've always worked for yourself. Um, yeah. Was that always food related? No, um, food was clearly everything that I ate. Okay. Um, <laughs> But in regards of that kind of, I've done like banking, I've done insurance, um, um, but my main uh, business was marketing uh, for like about 25 years and, okay. and helping um, big companies sell more of their product. So we worked with lots of marketing companies, PR companies, advertising companies, uh, companies called experiential uh, marketing companies that kind of give you a a, a, a vibe and a feeling that way there even though they're selling beer or whatever and we've worked across the board from like local councils and Nike and Coke and everybody so literally I had a very long time of learning how to sell a product but more importantly about the positioning how important that is not to try and sell to everybody create your own kind of market Okay, that explains the success. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that explains the success. So, I mean, can you describe a time, if any, when you had sort of second thoughts and considered abandoning the business? I mean, have there been any major challenges along the way? Um, we've had some challenges, um, but I thrive on challenges. And because this project is got so much to do with, you know, myself, it's got so much to do with the legacy of my mother. It's got so much to do with putting Guyana on the map with all the other amazing people doing great stuff around the world in that respect. Um, so my only kind of wobble was when I had a little run of doing meetings and everybody, everybody was like either late or the boss man's just gone to lunch. And I'm like, well, I just called this morning to kind of confirm it. How can I go to lunch? So when I came back home and kind of was upset, my dad said something really simple. He said, this is Guyana. This is how we move. So either get used to it or just come up, come here as a holiday and, and enjoy yourself. And that was done. That was like, OK, right. And I started to understand that I need to now understand the, la the language and the culture of doing business in Guyana. That's that is so true. And so, yeah, brilliant advice, because um, I think so many people go to Guyana and, and they get frustrated with and think and actually they come with that very non-Guyanese way of doing yeah. things when actually they just need to readjust and become Guyanese again I guess they just need to chill out relax chill out, relax yeah exactly and, you know so for us what we found with having that was that there was no way that I could bring this uh, project to market in the time that I thought and literally we ended up doing a lot of kind of foundation work for about four years just to understand how to do things but more importantly to start building trust with with people that I want to do business with from my side of the fence and from their side of the fence in that respect there because this project that I'm doing is it, it, it is so huge it has to be dealt with with a lot of love and respect got to take your time no that's 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 a, a very good way a very good approach to be taking. Now, so I wanted you to, um, I think Guyana Speaks uh, became familiar with your products when you participated in our Border Bazaar at the Classic. Yeah. And um, of course, your sources were an immediate hit. Yeah, it was great <laughs> feedback. Yeah. Um, and since then, you've placed your products in some of the most uh, prestigious places. Where, where is the most prestigious place? I mean, where, where would we go to get your products? Well, we um, service a lot of kind of delis. Uh, we've positioned the brand as a premium um, Guyanese Caribbean food brand. Um, so for me, that made everything work that we had to like really work on the branding um, and just do everything different to everybody else. Um, so let's keep it really simple. Let's put on the tin what it actually means in that respect there. And let's kind of really position it not everywhere but let's position it in the right places so our main uh, deal that we closed recently is with selfridges uh we've been on the shelf for three weeks and they just put in the third order on friday so people people are buying it 
Um, and it's it's just great. I mean, you know, other than selling rum, we're now in Selfridges. It's brilliant. And we got, we've got a whole uh, plan to be in all of the right department stores and we've got a plan of action. We're just doing one step at a time. Everything for us is one small step at a time. That is absolutely brilliant. Well, I know where I'm going to be going next weekend. Thank you. <laughs> Having run out. Thank um, you. <laughs> so, um, so I've I uh, so this is for uh, Rod's question was finally I've seen hot sauces used on so many dishes. Some yeah. people have been known to carry a small bottle of their own in their pocket just yeah. in case the host pepper isn't hot enough. <laughs> or, the food, or the food's not too good. Oh, the food's not too good. Briefly, can you share a story about a Pat and Pinky product and its usage? Yeah, no problem at all. Well, what I what what I found as an opportunity is that other than it being like a condiment that we put on the side of our of our meals, I realized that I wanted people to uh, to give you an example, a hot sauce bottle, pepper sauce bottle for an average user might be in their house for like six to eight months. Yeah. And I kind of was like, well, that's too long. So literally with some of my market who might not be uh, the, mo the, the most confident cooks or whatever, we've got them using it as a marinade. So literally you don't have to know anything that you're doing. You use this as a marinade, you got the right flavor. We got weary in it, we got broad leaf thyme in it, we got fine leaf thyme in it, we got all the garlic, ginger. So whatever happens, the flavor is gonna be what you need it to be. And if you're confident, you can just use it however you want to use it. But it's been amazing seeing people. We, we, we made a, a product recently, which is a, a bunjal curry paste, which has never been done before. But I wanted somebody to be able to um, have a Guyanese curry on the table in 20 minutes. And that's how that happened. So, you know, we got six cultures. We got a lot of food and, and uh, products that will be coming over from us for the next few years. That's fantastic. And I like the idea that people are being introduced to distinctly Guyanese things. Like you're saying the weary, weary pepper. I mean, I presume that you're actually labeling them with those kind of, are you, are you putting the ingredients on in that way so they can see? I have to know, do that by law. Yeah. You have to just, okay. So it's like the broadleaf time, you yeah. know, finally. Yeah. Um, I, I was looking at a, a conversation that was going on on Guyana Speaks on the Facebook and everybody was going on about married man pork. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got, we got, we got, we got, we got, got, we, got, we, got, we, got <laughs> we got, we got kilos of that. We're coming, to flood, we're coming to flood up Guyana, England when I come back. That's fantastic. But so I'm curious, are you going to be doing some sort of TV program or something to introduce the public to these? Because, you know, married man, pork, how, how is an Englishman going to know, like, what is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got we got plans going on. We got plans. We got plans. We got, we got, we got secret plans. plans. We, yeah, there's secret plans. But but what 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 we want to do is, you know, really work with everybody around the world who is pushing Guyana forward in that respect there, especially like the food, and to start putting some stories together because right about now, everybody needs to be selling, to be speaking, to be pushing the narrative of Guyana, South America. And there's a lot of countries out there that do amazing food. And unfortunately, I'm biased. Our food is next level. It's untouchable. Totally untouchable. <laughs> well, yeah. I, 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 um, not to detract from your product, but um, I know that the, you know, Faye Gomes in, um, Faye, it, uh, what's it called? Kaitra Kitchen in Elephant and Hand Castle. Of, Hand of a goddess. Hand of a goddess. And she was in the Financial Times. I saw it this morning. Did amazing. you see it? Yeah. yeah so, um, so but, but that was, but that was somebody who wasn't Guyanese who had gone to Guyana. And yeah. just fell in love with Guyanese food, and now he's in love with face. <laughs> so, enough said. Like, enough said. Yeah. All so. you got to do is give him some pepper pot, and he's good. <laughs> exactly. That's fantastic. So, um, and just Adele is saying, what's the name of your brand? The name of uh, our brand is called Pat and Pinkies. I'm Pat, and my mum's nickname is Pinky. Pinky, and that's where the Pinkies come through. And it just was one of those things that that was. Uh, 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 it just worked, it made sense. But more importantly, I wanted to kind of give people a vibe of, of my amazing family and my amazing mother. 
So it just was like, well, literally, however many bottles we do, that name's going to be out there and then we can speak about it and the great legacy that she left with my father for myself and my sister to keep pushing forward as people. Thanks for that, Pat. And um, there's a comment here from Tafawi saying he, he thinks um, Gordon Ramsay also recognised recognize the culinary riches of, of Guyana. Although I'm a, not he, sure he, about he his didn't, chicken didn't, pepper pot that he was trying to cook. Well, I, I didn't know. I, I could tell you. I could tell you a couple of things. Uh, it was really great that he kind of came over. I've lost count of the amount of times that I've been trying to connect with him in that respect there. But I've got to realize that this is a TV program, and they come in to do what they need to do, and they come out. And uh, so, so first, first things first. Thank you very much for the help and promotion, but we need to be the ones that's pushing our culture forward. We're going to be doing it with a hell of a lot more integrity in that way there. And, you know, it, we, we need to control how we make this thing shine, not other people coming from other angles. So that's that's one of my main missions. Everybody needs to be able to rise and to live good when they work with Pat and Pinkies. That's kind of where we're at. Fantastic. Well, I think we'd all agree with that. And we're looking forward to your TV program, uh, <laughs> Mr. Hines. That's the challenge to you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Thanks, guys. Pat, much appreciated. Can you stay online? Because I'm sure there'll be other people who will have questions afterwards. So I'm going to go to Mark okay, Dalgetty, no but thank you so much. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So I'm going to unspotlight you. And now I'm going to look for Mark. I don't know where Mark is. Let's see. I know he's here, but I've just got to... Here he is. Hang on. Spotlight. Yay! Brilliant. <laughs> Hi, Mark. How are you? Hello, I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon good. to you and everyone on the platform. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on Guiana Speaks. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I hope Rod sent you these questions. I don't know if you had them. So um, the first question, of course, I think, well, first of all, I should say I'm a real Dalgetty tea fan and everybody knows I drink your ginger tea. <laughs> so <laughs> just, just saying it. Um, your products on the shelves um, of the major supermarkets of the UK, of course, give the Guyanese um, a sense of pride. Um, Rod was describing it as being akin to the flag flying at the Olympic Games. And, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit heavy. <laughs> that's a bit heavy. Although, <laughs> although I, was, I was delighted to see that um, Guyana's in the top 20 best dressed um, team for the Olympics this year. Yes, <laughs> there was, yes, yes. There was some, some report. But I just wanted to ask you, as a chemical engineer, can you describe the circumstances that actually led you into the tea industry? Um, well, yes. Um, I mean, although we began to do teas, uh, my passion is really making things, you know. And uh, 25 years ago, um, I was back home. I was trying to relocate uh, back to Ghana after to finish studying. And then found myself in a, a bit of a financial situation. As, I mean, that sounded English. I mean, I was broke, basically, full stop. And I um, saw an opportunity where, um, you know, the Europeans were calling this emerging tea, uh, herbal tea. Uh, and back home, we were actually calling it bush tea. And the irony of the whole matter is that um, back in Guyana and probably the Caribbean, bush tea is normally for the poorest guy, the guys in the country, the ones who cannot afford Milo and, and coffee and a nice bottle packet stuff. And then at the same time, I mean, when it comes to the to European markets, it's called herbal tea and it's a Mr. Herbal tea because it's more expensive than all the normal teas. And it's only the highfalutin people um, that, that purchased it. Um, but what was interesting at that time is that um, the, their, the, what we would call bush tea that was coming to Europe was actually, very, was actually terrible. They didn't actually have no flavor. So, I mean, um, they were using a lot of flavorings to enhance the flavor. And um, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to try and introduce these Europeans to uh, to proper her, proper bush tea, but obviously bush tea in a tea bag. So I would say that's where my chemical engineering knowledge came in, is really taking that aged product and putting it and packaging it properly, that I felt that I could walk anywhere in the world with my head high. You know, as you know, we started with Corilla bush, but by the time we finished packing Corilla bush into a tea bag, I mean, it was like a delicacy, you know, considering it's so bitter and probably the worst tasting tea we did. <laughs> 
but at the same token in time, once you explain that it was good for diabetes or in all these various ailments, I mean, it, that become totally negligible regarding to the taste. So, I mean, um, in, in, in a brief, that was um, basically my passion was really about looking and taking that, um, I mean, especially taking a product like say the Cerise or Sorrel or Lemongrass and nurturing it. I mean, obviously you had to spend a lot of time teaching farmers how to dry it properly, slowly to, to hold the flavor and then take it through that process of chopping it and blending them together and then tea bag, the whole tea bagging process um, to end up with a product that basically almost tastes as though you've just literally picked the product off the off from a farm or something like that. How how long did it take, you know, from the from the moment you had the idea that you were gonna do this? How long did it take before you became sort of a I'd like to say like a su successful business? How does it how long did it take to the stage where you you actually profit from from what you're doing? Um, uh, to tell the truth, I basically profited within the first three months because I mean, um, it wasn't always in a tea bag version. I mean, the first set of packaging we ever did was actually in um, loose packets, one ounce packets. Um, actually, that's when the tea bag technology came after, because as I said when I was back home, and then um, somewhere along the line. Um, as I said, I was trying to relocate to Guyana, and then I came to London, and someone asked me for something called Cerisee Bush, which um, in Guyana, we don't know the Cerisee, but then it was an old Chinese guy, and he's guy, and he said, man, you know, this is, we call this Corilla Bush back home. I said, you want Corilla Bush? He said, yes. And I said, I mean, how many packets? And he said, uh, any among. I said, any among, that's a crazy number, you know, just give me an idea, 5,000, 1,000. He said, oh, all right, could bring 5,000, and I said, what? So I just speed right back down to Guyana, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I, I'd arrive broke, normally I'd arrive broke, make some money, pay my mortgage, head back to Ghana, spend six months. And I looked at my credit card and I realized, hey, I, I have about a thousand pounds left in it. And I said, hey, you know what? I'm not even going to sit here for another three months. I'm heading straight back to Guyana. Bought a ticket in those days, it was about five, 500 pounds. Head straight to Guyana. Went over to Nimes where my grandparents um, uh, lived um, and I grew up. I mean, in the summer times, I was always in the West Bank of, um, of, of Guyana, Nimes, Bagotsville area. And I uh, got uh, some of my cousins and guys in the village. We went into the back dam, collected a set of the Corilla bush. And um, I took it back home in North Rongveld. And um, luckily, you know, my parents were not in the country because I actually turned the whole house into a little factory. Was in the living room, sat down with the scissors cut a thousand pounds of um, the Corilla bush into 16,000 one ounce packets with the scissors and uh, ship it back to London and came and sold it for um, 50 pence each. And then whilst I was doing there, I mean, as I said, it's first a means to end. And then an then Indian shopkeeper from India, because I was calling the stuff tea, but it was actually in a packet. It wasn't a tea bag. And he started saying, we call this tea, where's the tea bag version? And then is when I started, that just rang through my head for a couple of days. And I said, damn, this is, you know, this is what, you know, this is now getting me excited. And it's just taking that Corilla bush and put them in the tea bag. So then I used the money from that and literally um, from the, the generation of, um, the, because I mean, what happened is that uh, I made 16,000 one ounce packets from the investment, earned about 8,000 pounds, right? And then I took that money and invested into tea bag technology. And then from there, you then decide, well, okay, um, I only had this one tea walking around the, the, the shops with, and then I started, well, let me make another one. It became lemongrass, then it became peppermint, and then it became, and I mean, now, as you know, we probably have over 30 different lines of tea in the market. That's amazing. I, I always think it's so funny the way um, words matter. You know, like you were saying, there's bush tea, and it's it's you know, poor people's tea and then herbal tea. It's like um, it's like the difference between an immigrant and an, and an expat, <laughs> you know, like it's the same <laughs> thing, but but one is posh and one isn't. So mm. yeah, I like I like that you uh, had that kind of vision. Um, but competition is pretty fierce, I think, in, in that kind of sector. What makes Dalgetty teas a product that stands out above all of the others? Our teas always tend to be stronger because, I mean, uh, we take our time and I mean, we work from the farmers up from the bottom end up. So um, whereby I take a lot of major global corporations, they buy and they bulk buy. I'm not sure exactly what they do. Um, they also spend a lot of time and in, in more working on cost efficiency. We, we spend a lot of time, first of all, working on, on quality efficiency. So we, we spend a lot of time with, with farmers teaching them exactly how to dry the product. It takes longer, slower. 
to maintain that flavor. So, I mean, a lot of people say when they buy Dalgeny teas, I mean, you put it in your cupboard, it actually smells the cupboard up. You know, if you buy enough of them, 10 packets and you leave your cupboard open, it smells the whole kitchen up. Because what we do is spend a lot of time, you know, just focusing on the quality and, and the strength of the tea. And I think that was one of our greatest USPs is, is in unique selling points was really about keeping that strong strength and, and flavor. So if somebody drink a Dalgeny lemon and ginger, they actually feel the ginger on their chest. If they drink a peppermint, they think they sweat this, they, they, they're sucking a, a, a peppermint, mm. you know, and, and that was being really our, um, um, our USP in terms of penetrating the market uh, in the UK. Because we also, I already realized that, I mean, most of the European and global brands, they, they, their product was very well packaged, always nicely packaged, sometimes envelopes and all sort of stuff. But then when it came to actually drinking the product, it was a totally different experience. That's so true. That's like, um, oh gosh, I, I, you know, I always, I, people always catch me out with their beautifully designed, you know, packaging, and then you open up a herbal tea and you have it steeped in water for five minutes, and the thing still just tastes like coloured water. <laughs> it's rubbish. So I completely get that. <clears throat> I, I wanted to ask you one of the questions I was interested in actually is. You know, obviously you have to keep your supply constant. How do you manage, and, and you're based here, I guess, most of the time. So how do you manage to keep your supply of teas coming in from Guyana to the UK as a, you know, I mean, how do you manage to make sure that that supply is always there? Um, I mean, we, only, we don't only buy teas from Guyana, no. we actually literally buy worldwide, you know, from Guyana right across to Africa. Um, but obviously in the early days, it was purely Guyana, which we, we tend to have gotten a lot of self, into a lot of trouble um, because, I mean, the, the, the supply wasn't consistent. And I mean, you don't really have, like, say, in some countries, you might have one farm with 100 acres of land. In Guyana, what we actually have is like two or 300 little farmers with one acre. So it, it's very common, some, sometimes managing them. I mean, sometimes some of the things, I mean, eventually you just have to like, uh, just have to laugh actually a lot of times because else you, else you just, you might just commit suicide with some of those guys. <laughs> but I mean, um, I mean, because I mean, sometimes a guy in the back of the court, he could say, oh yes, I've got a thousand, 2,000 pounds of lemon gauze at Coraila Bush. And I mean, you send the truck all the way up there and he's got 100, 200 pounds, all because he just needs to get some money that weekend to go out. So you send a big, big truck to the back of Crabwood Creek thinking you're going to get this thousand or two thousand pounds, you know. Um, but over the years, we learned how to deal with it. I mean, we tried to make sure we go into an area. We, we, I mean, we sort of have a, a, a unstructured cooperative situation where we have numerous people like saying West Coast Burberry. So where we go, that years ago, when that one guy could have tricked us into going up there and, and say he had a thousand and don't have your hundred, we will have about 10 or 20 guys there. So by the time the guy who said this, had his thousand only had a hundred, you then stop at at least another 10 or 20 farmers within that, um, let's say a, a, a 10 mile radius who actually has a hundred kilos or a hundred pounds each. And that's how you end up building capacity. But then more importantly, what I had to do with Guyana is, is um, as we began to develop more and more flavors is let Guyana focus a lot on just one product too, so that they could be very good in, at one thing. Because when we started giving them too many different um, things to supply, they began to get confused. I mean, in the early days, we, they actually got me into a lot of trouble. I mean, like uh, I could say one example where um, we had them doing both Corilla bush and lemongrass. And then someone decided to um, take an uh, old bag that they had some Corilla bush in and put lemongrass inside. Now, could you imagine now, I mean, you know, a tea bag has about two grams of tea. I mean, there's no problem if you have a, a two, gra tea, two grams of tea inside of it. And I mean, it's lemongrass and it's got 0 0.02 grams of Corilla bush. I mean, that just going to chew the flavor totally off. <laughs> I mean, the other way around is not a problem because maybe you have 0 0.2 grams of lemongrass in, in, a, in a Corilla bush tea bag. Then, okay, the Corilla bush is rich, it's stronger, it's bitter, it's going it, it, to, all it's going to do is make the Corilla bush weaker. But the total opposite way around, I mean, um, we had a major problem. Luckily, that was in the early days. I wouldn't like that to happen now. But I mean, you know, some people drank the lemongrass and as you know with lemongrass, I mean, when you pick that up to drink, you're smiling. I mean, with, with, with Corilla bush, you, your face is at a different angle, yeah? <laughs> so, I mean, when you pick up the lemongrass to drink and you end up with a bitter taste, I mean, people actually thought they were getting poisoned. We actually literally had to pull the whole product off all the shops, totally redesigned the box and everything, all because of that one farmer that took a bag of, 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 of um, of, of an old bag of Cerisee of Corilla and put some lemongrass inside of it. But I mean, those are the kind of challenges you could have when you deal with Guyana. 
Thanks for sharing that. Um, Jennifer's just saying that, um, well, I, I think it's funny that Jennifer is saying this because she says her, your teas are quality and have the best flavors. She, um, I keep an open tea bag to keep my food cupboard uh, fresh smelling. So that's how strong it is. So that's that's a great testimony. But I, was, because you were then now talking about Corilla mixed with le lemon, <laughs> just like I don't know what that would have smelled like. Um, Grace is asking, have you ever thought of owning your own farm? You know, because I, I mean that obviously cuts out all of those those kind of problems. Well, presumably. Um. Yes, probably, but not right now. I mean, because remember that running a farm as an independent, separate business with its own challenges already. And I mean, with the speed that we're, I mean, we're in a very fast lane and what we're trying to do. So, I mean, um, you know, with the tonnage that we're moving with, I would have to spend a specific, a, a substantial amount of time uh, on a farm. I mean, I kind of like have that in my back pocket, sort of like a, as a, in my old age, you know what I mean? Having a farm and, and I mean, then, I mean, and, and doing something like that, but not right now, but it is definitely on the cards. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, can you just take the audience back to the bottom house in South Rumvelt? How many were actually involved in the initial birth of Dalgetty Teas and, and what was your management strategy to keep the momentum going? Um, there wasn't many people involved, just myself and uh, my neighbor's son next door. I, I was once sitting with the, with the scissors cutting up all the stuff, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I mean um, unfortunately, it was, no, it was all about just selling the product full stop. There was no specific management structure in place. I mean, and once I hit the UK, um, I mean, it was what I call a common sense approach. I mean, first of all, I understood that the product was going to be sold. I wanted to sell the product in an ethnic market, which was where there would have been all the migrants living. So I literally went into the library. In those days, you didn't have the internet and Google in order to just, you know, Google the area and see this is what they were. So I just went into the library and, um, you know, I, First of all, we were taught in the United Kingdom where all the high ethnic eaters were, the Brixtons, the Harlesdens, and then out to London, Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds. And, um, and then the next thing I did in the same library, they had a yellow pages and I photocopied the pages of all the supermarket and health food shops that were in each one of those areas. And um, I simply just put the packets of Cerisee into my a briefcase and I started walking and selling shop to shop. It, it was as simple as that. And I mean, um, broke down the UK into small areas like I did North London, then South London. I started from near where I lived, which in those days was in South, in, in South London in Morden. So then I covered the whole of South and then I went East and I went West. Then I covered the whole of the inner London and then I started driving out into the Birminghams. And, and, and um, whilst I was moving, I began to meet um, what you call wholesalers, which were people who might have been a, <laughs> a man with a van that is selling all the products and, and supplying to um, to the shops also. So once I began to establish meeting these guys, I began to encourage them to buy larger portions from me so that they could supply areas that I can't get to fast enough because it began to get very uh, challenging. As you can imagine myself alone on the road, walking to every shop. I mean, at peak, I can remember I had about a thousand shops that were supplying directly. And when the phone rings in the morning, you have a guy from Birmingham, to Far East Bristol and everybody wants some a packet that's a few packs of tea tomorrow morning. So basically you found a wholesaler who began to cover like say East London, one for West London. Then I went to Birmingham, develop Birmingham and then find wholesalers that could supply then. I mean, it took a bit of while, about a couple of years to do that. And then eventually then we found one big distributor who covered the whole country. In that way, I mean, that's when I took the time now to start building a state of the art factory. So I took a bit of different stages, you know, because in the early days I was on the road selling myself, building relationships. Also, when you're on the road, you, you, you tend to also get most uh, the ideas, you know, I mean, you begin to hear, oh, by the way, this tea, people are asking for this, or I mean, this is the best tea selling by a competitor, but, but, and that's the part, the but part is what becomes very interesting because the but is the one that gives you that ideology of what is a unique selling point. So, I mean, like say lemon and ginger is a good example I could give to you with that. You're on the road, you're selling. And I mean, at one time, I mean, at least in the ethnic shops, I, I used to be very proud that, oh, Dalgat is one of the best selling teas until one day I went into a shop in Tottenham and the guy said, um, oh, your tea is not the best. The best selling tea I have is lemon and ginger by Twinings. So I would say I bought it and, and I drank it. And I mean, I was like, okay, um, hmm, it's, it's okay, but not that great. And then when I went to my saw my mom had a box of that same lemon and ginger and she was busy grating some ginger inside. So I'm like, oh, 
well, well I'm going to make a lemon and ginger that you don't have to grate ginger inside. You know, so so that's one of the reasons why you have to be on the road in the early days. And then I made a lemon and ginger that was very strong in ginger. And then I became top with the lemon and ginger. So, Absolutely. You know, <laughs> but it's just little little things like that, you know what I mean, that gives you that uh, idea of, of, of what you're looking for. Because to develop a great product is really about offering something that another, the competitor is not offering, but the consumer is demanding or the consumer wants. Yeah, that's so fascinating. It's really interesting hearing about the logistics. So, I mean, you, you targeted the kind of ethnic market, but how did you, because I get mine from Tesco's. <laughs> so I want to know, how did you actually then transfer into the sort of mainstream supermarkets? Well, um, that was always a challenge. I mean, um, what the transpired, I mean, the little story with that is that obviously once you start developing your product into the small supermarkets, you now have a track record. So about over 20 years or so back, um, I obviously went to the tea buyer in Sainsbury. I went to the tea buyer in Tesco's. I went to the tea buyer as the Morrison, which is the top supermarkets in the UK. And, and as in Norman's fashion, they all said, no, not a bit of it. No, you're too small. This is ethnic and so forth. But then um, uh, at the same time, one of the supermarkets, I think was called Safeway, they're no longer here. They began to develop, um, and Tesco's, they began to develop a, a section they call the world food section because they began to realize that, look, it doesn't make sense you having a, a, a big supermarket in Brixton, for instance, with a very black area, and you try to get them to eat Yorkshire pudding because in, it's not <laughs> going to happen. You see what I'm saying? You have to sell them the things that they're accustomed to eating. So they yeah. formed a section that they call the Carib, Afro-Caribbean section or the, the world food section where they, they section off products from India or the Caribbean and China, just that section where a hardcore people from these regions could mm -hmm. come and buy a product that they wanted. So um, then I realized that that section was, was, was emerging and I went to the buyer from that section. And um, there again, obviously, they, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but he said no. Um, and uh, I, I didn't take no for an answer. So I actually went to, um, that was the buyer. I then went to about 15 or 20 of the managers of some of these stores in the high ethnic areas and said to them, do you know what product they knew it? Because I mean, obviously the big supermarkets are always looking at what the smaller shops are doing. It's, it's, it's competition all the time, you see? Um, and I said, would you endorse this product? Uh, would you like to have this product? And he said, he said yes, but you know, we don't do the buying. It, it has to come from the head office and the buyer. So I said, will you at least write the, the buyer and say to him, I, I, I endorse this Dalgetty product line. We see it in all the small shops in, 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 in within the um, you know, square mile of our, our location. So out of the 20, I mean, I got about 15 of the shops, um, the, the managers to actually write the buyer. So when I went back to the buyer, he just shaking his head. He said, well, I could imagine, I could understand you getting one or two because they might be your friends. But for you to get 15 guys to write me and say, I should, I should list your product. I think um, I, I would be silly of me not to, not to at least take a, a crack at it. But he said, I mean, what I'm gonna do, I'm only gonna take one line of tea from you and uh, Mr. Dalgetty, I mean, I'm going to give you three months. And if this product doesn't sell, I don't want to hear your voice again. You'll be molesting me enough, right? And, and, and before the three months was up, he actually called me. I think it was a guy named Smith or something. He said, Mr. Dalgetty, do you have any other products you could bring to us? And that was the beginning of it, you know? Um, and once we got it into the Tesco's and Safeway, we then went wrong to, I went wrong to Sainsbury and, and say, hey, look, Tesco's has got it. And you don't, and oh, oh, what? Then, I mean, obviously you use a carrot and stick situation and then, you know, Sainsby took it on and then you use the two scenarios of Sainsby and Tesco's and Asda took it on. And and that was, I mean, as I said, that was over 20 years ago, but that's how we ended up in, a, in all the big supermarket chains. So that's, I mean, such an inspiring story, Mark. Um, <clears throat> I have to ask you, because I, I saw, of course, you were traveling in, in Ghana, I think last year, was it last year? No, this um, year, this year. This year. So can you share with the audience, um, just tell us a little bit about your recent foray into the Ghanaian market. Well, I mean, um, uh, ultimately from the time we began to get into the, all right, we began to get into this whole business. I mean, it's all about developing a global brand. I'm not interested in just selling to Brixton and Harsden or, or the UK or the US or whatever. I mean, we, we began to expand from building in the UK. We obviously started selling into other European countries, into Holland, not, not massive orders, you know, um, but steady enough orders to feel great that the product is moving. But I mean, Sweden, Switzerland, Germany. So just odd pilots moving into European markets. Then we did a little bit of work in America on and off. Um, but then strategically in growing the company, 
we began to focus in on where best to use the resource that we have and maximize kind of care this business at that global level. And um, I felt that, I mean, considering that we are, we are a very strong brand in the ethnic market, the best place to head to is the African continent because at the end of the day, you have 1.5 billion people there. Yeah, and our teas are strong. People from the ethnic markets, that is what they like. They like, if you say you're selling ginger, they don't want to see a fancy package. They want the, the product to taste well. Mm. You know what I mean? You know, I, I always laugh when they say, I mean, you know, you go to a nice French restaurant and they spend a lot of time look, making the plate look fancy and the food on the plate look fancy, right? And I mean, the average um, Caribbean or black person goes in there and then they're like, I mean, they didn't give me enough food. You know, all they want is the food to taste good and a lot of food on the plate, full stop. You know what I mean? They don't want it to look fancy on the plate. You know what I mean? <laughs> they want it to, to taste good and they want a lot of food on the plate. That's it. <laughs> Keep it nice and simple, you know? Yeah. So, um, I mean, coming back to the target, the market. So we felt that the market that we want to enhance, to head to is, is, is African, African continent. So um, as a first move, we decided to move into Ghana. And um, I mean, in this case, I mean, because we decided in our concept of growing is, is to build bottom up. So we set up our own warehousing and distribution and everything in Ghana, our own warehouse salesmen on the road, vans on the road. And we started with Ghana. Uh, next move is obviously moving into Nigeria, which is really the market that we're really after because that's a market that has almost 200 million people. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's a more complex market, diverse, volatile and everything, but it's actually the one with one of the most uh, biggest opportunity. So right now, I mean, is embarking on the whole African continent using Ghana as a base. We you know, hoping by October we'll be in, 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 in Nigeria because we're moving at the pace there. And then we have feelers now into like South Africa, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Zanzibar, Kenya. Um, but um, with the volume of people that they have there, we almost silly not to decide to head into that market when you know in the ethnic market in the UK, which is which is made up of people of African, Indian, Chinese, um, origin that it'd be silly not to be headed into a market mm -hmm. like that, you know, um, with, with that capacity of people. So that that's where, where we are in that now. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, I, I mean, I grew up in Nigeria, so I know, I mean, things like Karaila and, you know, people like the kind of bush teas, <laughs> yes, yes, you know, yes. so of course it's going to be very popular. Um, I wanted to know as well, so aside from the kind of monetary rewards, you know, what motivates you? Like, because you're really like conquering, you know, you're, you're really doing the whole, it's quite massive to be going global. You know, what's what's actually motivating you? I, I think motivation is for me is as, as a person from a science background is just making things, you know, I, I am, I am, um, I am driven by i mean if i if like the average person if they look at the mango i don't see a mango i i see but okay i could take the mango skin and do this i could take the mango make juice i could do try the mango make a flavoring i look to see what i could do with the seed and it's how many products could i make out of that one mango so i i'm, I'm really driven by um you know i mean even like for instance the some of the teas we're doing i mean i mean we do research and going into the nutraceutical industry, which is probably taking the same, say, Corilla bush and put it into tablets, just capsules, and you know. But but that is the sort of stuff that gets me excited. I mean, the, the interesting thing in the early days, I mean, I, I didn't really know much about these bush teas or the her, bush teas that I call it the herbal teas. You know, I mean, I used to have to go to the guys at Border Market and ask them what's good for. And then I go and read up, there's a book in, 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 in the Guyana Library with all the bushes and tells you what they're good for, because I didn't really know much about what the actual teas were good for. And people used to call me, oh, Mr. Dalgetty, my belly's hurt me, which bush tea is it for? I'm like, oh, oh. Because I mean, I was more driven by the technology of taking the, the tea, because I'm thinking, I mean, it's over a hundred years we sit down having this bush and people just at border markets sell it in a plastic bag. We got to take it to the next level, you know? And, and, and that's what I'm driven by, is taking that product to the next level. No, that's that's so fascinating. So um, I think finally, I just wanted to ask. Um, of course, I know you're aware. You, I'm a, I'm aware you have a very large and loving family. How do you actually manage to balance your business life with your personal life? Um, well, it's, it's not a terrible situation. I mean, first of all, my kids are involved. From the time they're small, they have to start whether it's conking tea bags or whatever it is. I mean, at least that that's how they learn to that's how they learn to conk. <laughs> you know, me to say, um, uh, checking stock counting. Sometimes you send them with a van with the sales guys just to get. So it becomes they don't they don't think as 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 
working along in the business or doing anything is, is work. It's, it's more like play, you know? Um, you know, if we take them on the road and they have to go to the accountant to collect money, then you said, okay, you collect the money, accountant make sure it's the right change. How much is the change going to be, you know? Um, my wife is, uh, is an accountant by profession, so although we have an external, um, an external accountancy firm, she's involved in that part of the business, you know? Uh, my youngest daughter um, is now getting more, more involved, but she's working with the admin staff, you know, and then my, the ones who are weekends, they're out doing something or the other, um, you know, but that's how we try to, you, you know, you make work fun, you know what I mean to say? Yeah. Um, because if you make work work, then you're not going to want to get up to do anything. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, yeah. so that's why I try to um, get them involved in, in a fun way, you know, to, um, you know, apart from obviously now I'm beginning to travel again. So uh, like my wife's like, oh, okay. But then she understands that that's what we have to do if you try to do what we try to do, you yeah. know. So I mean, like obviously I was away and gone early this year for about two months. I'm now heading back in another two, um, two to three weeks again, uh, moving there, and then probably have to go to Nigeria. We're developing. Um, although we're heading in Africa, we're actually now developing a American um, um, subsidiary, which is going to happen by October. So I mean, I probably head across there also. So. I think she's just braced herself that I, this time around, I might be around. Um, not be as often, I mean, I'd, I'd be away, but I mean, once it's settled, I mean, I would be traveling, but wouldn't be spending a long time away. But mm. probably because of the COVID situation, I mean, before you could go and shoot off somewhere and in 10 days you're back. Now, I mean, when you got to come back and quarantine yourself and all kinds of stuff, you know, you, you better up just spending enough time so that you don't have to keep going back too often. Else you probably find half of the year you're in quarantine. <laughs> yeah i mean that's crazy i i mean actually yeah. that's that's i wonder how businesses like yours have actually managed during covid has it been really challenging or is it kind of worked really. out? i mean i mean this zoom has really helped a lot actually it's, it's, it's helped a tremendous a lot because i mean before when i might have been running around the uk or in europe or so having to go and meet people it's easy to just stay right at home and go on zoom and cover three four five different distributors or, or, or meetings even in one day, you know, yeah, um, yeah. you know, compared to having to travel anywhere. So it's kind of like being, um, it's had its advantages, obviously, you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. So just a final question. If you had to choose one of your teas to take to a desert island, which one would it be? <laughs> that's a very difficult question. <laughs> Actually, you know, the irony of the whole tea stuff is that um, because we got so many teas, sometimes, you know, you, you might drink a particular tea and, um, you know, you're like, okay, I'm liking this one here. You're enjoying it. And I mean, maybe lemongrass or meringue or something like that, or turmeric. And um, and you're like, oh, this is the really nice one. This is the best one. And after two or three weeks, I mean, one morning you look in the cupboard, oh, I haven't drank um, cinnamon and peppermint for a little while. And then you drink, oh, this actually tastes very nice, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then you start drinking that for another three, four weeks until one day, there's none of that in the cupboard and i mean it, it, that's a very difficult question i mean I, actually one of the only teas i would say um especially now in the covid times i tend to ensure i drink you know it's things like the the, the cerise the corilla or the turmeric teas which is good for uh, inflammation in your system because as you know um the 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 the, the stuff in your body the, the stuff that harness most viruses and, and and germs and bacteria is really inflammation and mucus so uh, in trying to rid yourself or minimize the mucus in your system, turmeric comes in very well for that. So, I mean, now, I mean, also we change our narrative with our teas and not just about the strength. We know using a lot about the fact that it builds your immune system. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I'm, I'm drinking a lot more teas, you know, than I, I was before. And, um, you know, uh, even uh, so my child, I mean, because we were also sold tea to, as you know, um, China many years ago, you know, and, and we have South Korea developing at the moment, you know, because we tend to go against the grain, you know, I mean, I mean, I really, I mean, there's a fear and then there's fearlessness. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I mean, as, as a company, we always look at markets that we feel that there's an opportunity. We, we don't, we don't look at like say China as a place that we should buy from. We're thinking that why can't we sell to them? Mm. You see what I'm saying? So we actually sold to China. I mean, to the extent that one time they wanted us to have a faction, and it was a bit too, it's a bit too heavy. It was about 15 years ago. Mm. And then even in the UK, I mean, the, um, the borough that we were in, they were like amazed that this company was able to sell tea to China. You know, I mean, they ended up giving us an award as a global business, you know. <laughs> but I mean, uh, going back to your question, I mean, it's, it's a very difficult question. I mean, it, especially in this era. <laughs> you know, yeah. and because some of the worst tasting teas is the one I have to drink all the time now. 
I mean, the nice tasting ones like lemongrass is still good also, you know, so I mean, uh, I, 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 don't, I, I don't have a specific one. It's very hard. <laughs> well, I, I would go for the Karaila because as bitter, bitter as it is, it's the one that always makes me feel clean inside yes, somehow. Yes, 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 <laughs> I don't yes. know. It just, it, does, yeah, it really makes you feel like you've, you, you're having some health benefits, but maybe yes. that's just because it doesn't taste nice. So you're like, <laughs> it's, a, it's a medicine. <laughs> But, um, uh, but Mark, thank you so much. That's been so fascinating. Much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Really grateful. Um, I think we'll just open up now to, to questions. And as I've got some questions already in the um, chat, um, I did see one. Someone was asking. So John David was saying, any thoughts of a multi-pack for people who want to sample a wide range? Actually, that's a, that's an interesting question. Yeah, so that they can taste all of your. Um, in our you know. case, we actually did do a multi pack, but it didn't do very well. I thought it was a great concept, actually. Uh, and the funny thing is that we actually used um, some carabiniums. We had a pack we call um, uh, the Reggae Selection and the Calypso Selection, right? Yeah. Which yeah. had three different varieties. But then what we found is that. Um, the people who want who drink a lot of herbal they know what they want and they just want to go for exactly what they want. So um, I think if I was selling that particular product, if we had a stronger mainstream white consumer market um, uh, penetration, we found that it would do well in that sector of the market. But at least in the in the ethnic or the black consumer uh, market, um, a lot of people just know what they want. They afford to buy that. And then if somebody tells them this is good, they just go and buy that whole packet. So in, in theory, the concept was great, but when we practice it, it wasn't as great as it, as it seems it should be think it should have been. Well, I, um, Gordon Stewart is now suggesting that you need a Corona 19 pack. <laughs> 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 that was funny. So somebody else is saying, "What about the medicinal marijuana tea?" Okay, you're talking about um, uh, hemp. Well, it's not ma marijuana. There's actually a big movement in hemp at the moment, which we was doing some research on. You know, um, because I think that comes from the family of marijuana or something like that. Um, and we're just doing some research on and off research on that, and just keeping an eye. I, I keep an eye on it. I mean, obviously, if marijuana becomes a totally legal product, we 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 be quite happy to make the tea for it. You yeah. Know, but one, once it's something that's going to get you locked up, I'm not happy about we had into the jail anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, quite exactly. So, um, Rod uh, Alsop is saying, who are your U.S. resellers, um, specifically in or near the Washington D.C. area? Um, at the moment, um, we actually have a small wholesaler in Atlanta, which is actually funny enough. It's a guy from the islands, but he's called Georgetown Food Supermarket. But more importantly, there's a company called Brong Line, Brong, B R O W N Line dash E N T dot com. They sell a lot of our teas online in America. But hopefully by October, we will have our own system. We actually literally have containers heading out in another two weeks into America. It's going to be going into warehouses in New York. Um, but American Associates is going to look after that. Um, so we set up our own that'll get to USA, but that's not going to make it. I mean, I haven't told much people. I mean, this is the first time I'm actually telling it to, to the public um, because I, I like to say things after I've done it. I don't like to say it before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, glad to hear that, Mark, because as you've been talking, I've been Googling diligently to see where I can get it locally. But I yeah. only buy from, from the UK and the shipping is a little expensive. No, so, from the UK is very expensive. So if yeah. you go to Brown Line, ENT, dash ENT. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and you'll be able to get it in, in one day. Sounds <laughs> okay. great. All right. Thank yes. you for that. We'll be in touch All right. for sure. All nice right. One. Yeah. Um, Grace is asking, is your product available in Canada? No, it's not available in Canada. Uh, for the people in Canada, I, I send them to the same Brown Line company again. Uh, Brown Line, ENT, that, uh, that com. Yeah. Okay. Dash ENT, yes. Fantastic. Well, I can't see any. Let me see if I. I don't think there are any other um, questions. I think somebody wondered, was asking about organic products. Um, you know, like, did you, do you supply shops like the whole food market and Planet Organic? I mean, are you, you, I wasn't even sure actually. Are your teas organic or? Um, the, the ingredients are organic, but we're not a certified organic supplier. 
So uh, most of our products and the, the ingredients itself is organic, but normally for you to like advertise as a say, an organic supplier, you have to be a member of some a, a association called the Soil Association. And basically what they do, I mean, you pay them some crazy money, I don't know, 20, 30,000 pounds and you become a member and, and then they would sign off and say, well, okay, we know you got it from this guy and this guy I went and check and he's definitely certified organic and then you could put the emblem on it basically. But I mean, um, so we don't sell the products made on, on an on organic front, but what you find is that um, our ingredients are actually organic. So like on a lemon and ginger, the ginger is actually organic. And I think we, we actually say it's organic ginger, but we don't say the product itself, lemon and ginger is an organic product. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I'm just going to break there for a minute to make some announcements. And while um, I make the announcements, if anybody has any other questions that they want to direct to Patrice or Mark, um, and also um, Jem, Auntie Jem is also still online. If you have any um, questions, put them in the chat now. But um, I just wanted to make an announcement about GUSDA because um, GUSDA is going to be presenting its Zoom emancipation celebrations on Sunday, the 1st of August um, from 7 p.m. till 10 p.m. Um, that's British summertime. Um, so what time would that be? I think that's 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Guyana time, Caribbean time, North American time. Um, and I'm just going to read the information. Tafawa's just forwarded this information to me, so I'm just going to read it out. It says, this rich cultural program will include contributions from, amongst others, Dr. Michelle Yasantua, Colin Bob Semple, FRSA, Arthur Torrington, CBE, with special um, storytelling features by Dion Glasgow Douglas of All Story Got... Oh, our story got melody, and then um, Sandra Agard, and also I think there's going to be musical entertainment by Mr. Marlon, Marlon, and um, DJ Maliki. So um, I'll put actually Tafawa as you, as if you, I guess you're still there. You can put all that information in the chat so that people can. Um, copy that information if they they need it the other thing I just wanted to mention is that Guyana Speaks doesn't normally do a um, an event in August but we are going to be doing a Guyana Speaks special which is going to be on Sunday the 15th of August at 3 p.m so not at 2 at 3 p.m and it's going to be about the history of um, the Portuguese in Guyana and um, I've got um, an academic called Dr. Joanne Collins Gonzalez, who'll be joining us from Canada, um, just to talk about the history of the Portuguese. And also we'll be having Maggie Harris is going to be, who's also got a Portuguese background. She's going to be doing um, some poetry. Uh, and we're also trying to form a panel of people who are going to be just be talking about their family histories and their family backgrounds. So, um, so that's just a special one off Sunday the 15th at 3 p.m. But I'll, I'll put all that information on the Guyana Speaks Facebook page and, um, you know, I'll circulate it as usual. But just, just to be aware that it's not on the last Sunday of the month and we never have a Guyana Speaks on the last Sunday of the month because it's a bank holiday weekend um, in, in August. Um, now, so let me just check if anybody else had any more questions. Does, does anybody have questions? If you do have a question, just feel free to um, unmute and um, share a question. I'm just gonna remove- Hi, Doc, could I? Who, could who, I? This is Auntie Joyce calling. Oh, Auntie Joyce, welcome. I, I don't have a question. I just want to tell you how my head feels so big, 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 big at all these people who are doing these wonderful things. And to Jem, many, happy, happy birthday to Jem from Aunt Joyce. I can't say Auntie Joyce because we, we are the ones who they call an auntie now. The <laughs> el we are the elders in the family. So congratulations and so nice to hear from you. It was so wonderful. You know, I bless you young people who are doing all these wonderful things. And to Mark Dalgetty, belated condolences to you about your mom, because I used to see her very often. And thank you very much. And it's, it's, it's love. I love you, children. Plenty, plenty love to you all. <laughs> plenty, plenty love back at you. Plenty love, yes, <laughs> yes. This is so wonderful. It, it really is wonderful. 
Thank you. And uh, uh, Auntie Joyce, did you used to drink um, bush teas when you were? I mean, it's, it, you, listen to me. The only time you got it, it you live in the back in, in that same SBM suite is flat the art and sweet broom and conga pump <laughs> and bush tea. You're only getting chocolate Sunday morning or green, or green tea, mazawati or red roast tea Sunday morning. But for, uh, and then there was a lime, there was also a lime tree by our front door. You pick a few limes and you pour it in the hot water, you get lime tea. And it, <laughs> it took me a long, long time to buy herb tea, especially when the Americans calling it herb. I said, why don't put the H when it is herb? Right? <laughs> and they selling you bush tea in this bag. I said, but you know, it's like when they call you prawn cocktail. You buy the prawns out by Pennington Market and the tickets in the coast shrimps and the fried shrimps. And they tell you now it's a prawn cocktail. Heavens, bush tea called herbal, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, when, when, when my nephew, when my nephew starts selling, they'll get his tea. I've got to buy the tea now, whether it's bush or herb. <laughs> <laughs> Flat of the earth, sweet broom, conga pump, <laughs> lemongrass, lime, yeah. Oh, gosh. And then, uh... on, another one. You, listen to me. You remember, you remember the man that used to, used to do the, um, the bush calypso? Mom mm. piaba, tom piaba, mom piaba, woman piaba. Palms of Fardock and Lemongrass, Millie Root, Dolly Root, Granny Back Bomb. Well, yeah. Right? Remember? That's one of the greatest tunes of Guyana. Remember the, 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 the weed song? Yes, yes, that's a great tune. <laughs> yeah? Right. Mom, Piaba, Oman, Piaba, Tanta Fardock and Lemongrass, Millie Root, Dolly Root, Granny Back Bomb, Bitter Tumping and Dwight Teasum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, I know it got it gets it got social mobility now. It's herb or herb. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that a, is that Bill Rogers? Bill Rogers, yes. yes. Bill Rogers. You can, you can Google it. I think they're still singing it. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So 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 we have come up in the world. We have come up in the world now. Is herb tea. <laughs> so um and if you wanted patrice to 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 produce something and and bottle it up and put it in a in a jar what what, what would that be i ain't got anything special any any anything no, that... what 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 did you use in your childhood mostly you know like your weary weary pepper sauce like what yeah, were the I things did, you... i miss weary weary pepper everything was you know when you used to make your nice your, your nice um stuffed eggs and your, and your, nice, your nice red weary pepper on top of it <laughs> I love and, and if my I used to grow my mom poke in my backyard in West in, in, in Rhymeville. Mm. <laughs> I don't know how it came by that name. I was gonna I was just gonna ask you. I'm so, so intrigued. Some, funny enough, funny enough, <laughs> I have a friend who grew up in Burbese and she said they used to call it basil. It's, it is a form of basil. It's yeah, a form of basil. basil but, in, um... in, in, in Burbese, where she grew up. Okay, they, they, they call it basil. It. Yes. Okay. But to us was mad mom pork. Yeah, well, it's it's a much more not fun Not married name. man pork, it's married man pork. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm not even going to try. <laughs> With my terrible English accent. Oh, I'm darling. Married, you can't I'm say married man pork. I'm ma massacre the um, Guyanese. Married man pork. Okay. So, um, the plan... Oh, gosh, somebody's got feedback on their... um. I think it's gone now. Uh, yeah, it was just the feedback. Um, I don't think there's any more questions. Okay. Um, oh, Gordon. Gordon, Gordon, go for it. I thank uh, Guyana Speaks team for, for providing such another informative and inspiring uh, session again. Uh, Mark, I was ju just asking, um, have you ever thought about setting up like tea shops or shops that just sell tea. I mean, you got so many products right now. So you can have like a, a, a shop where people go in and taste the tea. Of, of course, in England, it's quite a tea drinking country. So that's a, that, that's a, that's a, uh, a question. But you, um, you mean like one of those post shops? <laughs> well, well, they Lions, Lions tea corner. They can do it. They can do yeah. it. Yeah. The other thing is that uh, myself and Karen, we went to wake last night and uh, of course, there wasn't a lot of social distancing and it was crowded and that. So when I came home, 
my drink was uh, some Dalgetti uh, meringue, uh, turmeric, and the Ceresi, which is the Corilla. And I put all three of those tea bags in the cup and, and that's my drink to keep my immune system going. So <laughs> what I'm saying, I suggest that we, you should have a Corona pack. <laughs> Actually, um, the first part of the question, which was to do with uh, having tea shops, um, it's an idea, but it's a, then again, it's stay, sort of like staying in your lane and how we're looking at growth, right? Um, and expansion globally. But I mean, it, it's a, almost a totally separate business model. So, I mean, it would take a lot of time for me to put that together. But saying that, I mean, what I have had or occasionally been doing is speaking to people who might be interested in having a coffee and branding it with Dalgetti and be giving them a license to do it, you know, in that way, because I mean, you know, because the business concept is totally different. It's, a, it's all about location and the experience of a consumer going in there and drinking a cup of tea with some biscuits and a nice sandwich and, I don't know, a smiley person behind the counter and the, the whole thing that goes along with a retail establishment, you know. Um, <clears throat> I would have to really siphon out and put new resources in a totally new business concept. So um, the kind of conversations I've been having really um, on and off over the last five, six, seven years is like, is looking for someone who might be, who is interested in actually having a tea shop, but branding it, they'll get you under our license and then have it that way. So then they could run that as their independent business and not me having to try and run a tea shop, you know, because I'm, a, I'm, I'm an engineer. I like to make things bulk machinery, factory driven, global markets, moving bulk containers, not standing up behind a counter selling a one cup of tea. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'd be totally bored stiff doing something like that, or <laughs> having to go and check out the shop even, you know. So that's the first part with that one there. Um, the 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 fact with the Corona um packet is an interesting concept, but I've got a strong feeling the challenge we'll have is just even naming the packet Corona, because they're going to be thinking that you're making a claim, you know. I mean, luckily enough, Corona bears are already called Corona bears. So, I mean, um, I mean, they took a bit of a battering when the coronavirus came out. Nobody wanted to drink the poor people's beer because they thought it was related to the virus. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so, I mean, uh, me probably bring out the Corona tea bag. Um, it's an interesting concept. I mean, probably worth looking at it, but I might have some hindrance in actually using the word Corona herbal tea. You can because right away they'll be probably you can call thinking it that a power, a power pack, power or related to immune system kind of thing. Right, right, right. Power, power yes. Health or something. Uh, That's yeah. A, yes, it's definitely worth a try. But I mean, you'll be surprised, especially even I mean, uh, I know that we're talking about you know names. I mean, in 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 Ghana, we haven't been able to. We have a tea that we call Slim Line, which is a very 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 good tea in terms of cleansing the body and weight loss. And we couldn't get it licensed listed in in Ghana. Because they said that it's making a claim, although you said slim line, we turned the name and we told it S line. They still didn't like the S line. They took the body off the package. They said they didn't like the body. We put another a, a, a glass. They said it's, it's indi indication that it's telling people it's going to slim. So sometimes, uh, you know, when you use these names and, and especially you go towards claims, although saying that, I mean, you could do research and have some sort of. Um, some sort of um, acknowledgement that this stuff is doing something because yeah, that's like immune boosting tea or something. Yeah, I mean, if you could do that and have some research behind it, which is actually one of the conversations I'm now having with um, one of my um, associates, right? Because I mean, I've got a guy in his associate, and her husband actually works within the pharmaceutical company. And as you know, most tablets don't actually work 100%. But what, what, what they get away with is having some sort of research, get I don't know, 300 people or 500 people to drink this particular product. And if, say, it's supposed to be for diabetes, if, say, three or 400 of them actually says, well, my diabetes went down, then they could say, well, hey, it's good for diabetes, but it doesn't cure your diabetes, you see? But then once you have that little research package to show I've done this research, you could then actually go sell the product on that level. So um, with those claims, I mean, it's, it's sort of like a conversation I'm having with certain stakeholders where I might be able to know, start even like say the Corilo, literally tell people that, hey, this stuff here is good for diabetes without making a traditional uh, claim, you know, that is known for traditionally as we know. Yeah. I hope you and Patrice um, both grow from strength to strength. Thank you. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Yes. Thank you. 
<laughs> um, Patrice, there's, we, I have a question. Sorry, I'm uh -huh. just going to cough. Hold on. <clears throat> The, the question comes from Grace. She says, can you name some of the products that you have out there? Yes, yeah. I, yes I want to hear some. Okay, um, we do pepper sauces, hot sauces. So we do a, a barbecue. We do an extra hot one where I'm using uh, chili from uh, next door neighbor Trinidad called Scorpion Maruga. We've got one that I've made into like a rum cocktail, one of the first rum cocktails uh, called Dark and Stormy, which has got lots of ginger and herbs in it. We do um, a curry paste, which we call Bunjal curry paste. We've got an all purpose. We've got a seasoning salt. We've got a chili oil. And um, yeah, we do some chutneys. We do an aubergine and balanje, um, a balanje and plantain chutney that's gone really, really well. We do a cranberry and sorrel hibiscus one. So um, as my partner says, we are, because we're so authentic, but also I'm from London. So if I want to do pasta, I can do pasta. As long as it's got the flavor notes of proper taste, we can do, you know, we're not, we're not just beholden to just doing one type of cuisine, you know? Um, so that's just how we kind of are building it. So she basically says we're the familiar with the exotic. Um, so it's allowed us to kind of educate people We've, used, we've still using our flavors, but as soon as you put the word chutney on it, everybody understands instantly what it is. What's the brand name? Pat, Pat and Pinkies. Pat, Pat and, and Pinkies. Pinkies. Yeah. Um, Patrice, can you actually just put your website details in the chat section just so that everybody can, I can definitely have, a, do have that. a quick look at that? Yeah. Um, but you also do coconut oil and things like that, don't you? Thanks for, remind, thanks for reminding me of what I do as well. Yeah. <laughs> I, was say, I, I, I normally get your coconut oil yeah, and yeah, it's yeah, very yeah, good. Yeah, oil, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. We do coconut oil. We get that from uh, the Pomeroon, the coconut, coconut country, as far as I call it. And, um, and yeah, it's been, it's been a good product. Um, um, what I've definitely found is that because coconut oil is everywhere in that respect there, we've got like an, a little bit of a USP by having Guyanese coconut oil. And it just kind of feeds into what our narrative is, which is that we come back home to work direct. Um, and like Mark, we, we also use other countries for raw products and raw ingredients, but there's product that I just have to get from Guyana. It, it would be great to hear it being called Pomeroon coconut oil though, because you know, it is coconut like country. So, I, I, you I think, know, it's I, a nice- I think, I think the brand is taken already. I think I've got Pomeroon, I've got Pomeroon coconut oil Pomeroon on the label. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, can I interject, it's Chandra. Uh, go ahead, Hi, Chandra. Chandra, hi. Hey, everyone, my Guyanese buddies. Uh, <laughs> hi, hi, Chandra. I, I've had several of um, my brother's um, products when we go to Guyana Speaks and Border Market. But I have to say that coconut oil is excellent. Thank you. Absolutely on the money. Thank you, thank you. That's great. Yep. Where can we get this coconut oil? Um, online at the moment. And depending on where you live, it's gonna, we're gonna be in particular like delis and farm shops and butchers. But the easiest um, way is online. Um, and what I'll also do is I'll, when I put, what's the word I'm looking for? When I put the website in the feed, I'll put a Guyana's uh, Speaks discount code for everybody as well to okay, give so them an introduction into the brand. Please, oh, we, we, we like, we like the sound of that. Is there any, anybody else, Carl? Any questions, Alison? Uh, Eve, I can see you there on Bruce's uh, Zoom. <laughs> Eve Nobrega, good to see um, you. I, I'd like to say quickly um, mm -hmm. to Patrice, there's very good work that he's doing. You know, um, I, I, we, we were having, a, I mean, when he first started, we used to have long sessions too, was talking about strategies to use, both him advising me, me advising him, you know, I was so excited when I saw his stuff come up on Selfridges, you know, because I knew the angle that he's aiming at, which is the high-end market and so forth. Uh, we used to have very long conversations about, because his strategy is slightly different from my own. I mean, I'm more into mass markets, global markets, 
affordable working class people, whereby Patrice strategically said, this is the angle that I'm looking at. And I know that that's an angle anyhow, you know, because you can't have, you can't really supply it to every angle. I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging to do that, you know? Um, so it's so good to see um, how he's progressing. You know, I mean, I, I I definitely salute him all the time and get excited when he likes. Cause he's a he's a real marketer. You know what I mean? I I I, I am a, a amateur marketer. I I'm the more the, the the engineer science man trying to do a bit of marketing. You know, Patrice is the ultimate marketer. You see, what I'm <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. um, that's funny. And, and the, the marinades I think that you've spoken about is a very interesting line. You know where people could actually just uh, I, I like that idea when you said you could take a curry and make a curry in, in 20 minutes you know what i mean to say um i think um focusing a lot on that would be really good because i mean especially these days when some people well a lot of people who can't cook they could just put in the marinades and, and actually have a good flavored food so i, I think that's a very good very good uh, uh usp and something you should work and continue working on but um buddy keep up the good Thank work you. okay respect <laughs> big up yeah, nice thanks Marky. <laughs> Vice versa to you. I, I, I would like somebody to come up with a business that does, um, you know, I, I, I always remember Auntie Jem's cheese straws. What else did Auntie Jem cook? She always used to make amazing food, but this, the, well, black pudding we can get, but there's certain certain <laughs> things that like we just don't get anymore. <laughs> and nobody, nobody makes them. But anyhow, can I just say, um, there's so many people online for Auntie Gem. I'm looking, I can see Eileen um, T Thomason. I can see, I think, um, who I haven't seen before. Where's Jackie? Did I see Jackie Chomley? Um, I don't know. I just, it just feels like there's a lot of people online here to wish um, Auntie Gem a really happy uh, birthday. Happy birthday. So, yeah. So yeah, let's let's um I don't know if this is gonna sound terrible. I, I I have a feeling that when we unmute to sing, it's gonna sound crazy. But it might be nice to unmute just to sing Auntie Gemma. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Yeah, that, that sounded as scary as I thought it would. <laughs> we, we, all, we, all, we almost did it. I think everybody in different parts of the world is coming in two or three seconds behind one another. <laughs> Happy birthday, Auntie Jam. This is Jackie. Happy birthday, Jackie. No, I'm just wishing her happy birthday. And my mom also is saying Neela saying happy birthday. Neela. That's my mother. Who else is anybody else for happy birthdays? Happy birthday, Auntie Jam. Oh. From Greer. <laughs> From Greer. Oh so God. yeah, I mean, um, the one last comment. I think somebody says Mark's surname Dalgetty is also placed in Fife, Scotland. Goodness. Where oh Terry, you're saying that's where your husband's from. There is a strong Scottish Guyanese historical connection, indeed. So um, thank you very much to our three fabulous entrepreneurs. Um, we'll have to do another session on entrepreneurs um, at some point next year. Unfortunately, all our we've pretty much filled up the rest of this year. But I hope we'll get to see you all on the 15th of August for the session on the history of Portuguese in Guyana. And um, but also at um, the event that Tafawa has, I guess, been organizing for Gusta. So and hopefully put the information in the in the chat section. So thank you all. And, and just, thank just, you. Before you, just before you go, where do I put the website address? Oh, into the chat thing. So you'll see if you go to the bottom of your screen yeah. uh, with your cursor, you'll see there's a chat. And just uh, click on that. And then when you go into there, oh, Tafawa's done it for you. There you go. Patternpinkies.com. Thank you. So we've we've got that. And I want to I want to yeah, discount for you guys as well, but I don't know how to do that part. So I've just done something, but I think it might have gone to somebody. 
Um, <laughs> well, I tell you what, you can you can send me the details on the email, and I'll put it onto the guy in a speaks Facebook page. Yeah. I, I, I like to do the same it. also. Actually, um, we're going to create a discount code for the. Um, uh, Guyana speaks definitely. Oh, we yeah. like so I'll that. Send we it like to you. that. Okay, yeah. so uh, people could uh, enjoy some discount on going online. So oh, that's fantastic! And also for the for the what about the people who are in the US? Can they benefit from the discount? Is that can. more complicated? No, they can only if they. But then they will have to buy from over here, so it oh, still I might see. be worth worth cheaper. They could check it out and see the difference in yeah. the discount could make a difference. Yeah. You know? Okay. I certainly will, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question, Rod. Thanks for uh, thanks for asking that. All right, everyone. Okay, it's been a real you. pleasure. Thank you so thank much pleasure. for joining as usual. And yes. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> really appreciate Bye. it. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good to see you. Bye. Be good. Be good, take care. Bye, bye, bye everyone. Bye. 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 Carl, hi. hi. Did you enjoy today? I uh, Rod was interesting, you know, very interesting. Um, one of the things that I was looking back at the, the memories of um, as um, what's her name when she spoke about the Atkinson Field. <laughs> that was really interesting because I yeah, there's the people piling up at the at Atkinson coming down in bus loads and the <laughs> when, Sunday best. With the oh yeah, bed. and the picnics and the parties and the RH car. She talked about you know that that steam I traveled on quite a few times. Yeah, it's very well, we memorable. Want, I I think we had a good mix of the old, the creative, and the and the new pretty much. Yes, it was really good. You know, I, yeah. I felt it was good. It's really really constructive and very informative. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Juanita keeps it flowing nicely. She she does such a great job. Well, she is a very good narrator. Yeah. yeah. I remember oh. my cousins came. My cousins came from Barbados in 1935 on the Duke de Mall boat. Okay. Oh. The Duke de Mall boat, yes. And there was an Arakaka that used to spend three weeks coming to England, Guyana, from England. Oh. Three weeks? Yeah, Arakaka took three weeks. From, mm -hmm. from from England to, to Guyana. Well, well, well. Aunt, Auntie Jem, you were well appreciated. I see you're still on line. Yes, well, she's still yes. online, but uh, uh, you 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 got yourself muted at the moment. But uh, be be aware that um, people loved you. Yes, she was oh, great. Yes, yes, yes. She is beloved. <laughs> It's a salute to all the senior citizens. Like, I mean, of course, like Jam and then there's Joyce and, and Doris celebrated her 90th last week. Doris. Thank you, thank you. you know, ah, okay. So, so do, you, do you know? Uh, do you know Joyce? Thank Trotman? you. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed the program. Uh, and and Joyce Trotman, are you uh, are you familiar? Hi, Jam. Hi, Jam. Plenty, plenty love. Hi, Jam. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> First day pass is three months now. We had a bird. We have a bird. We had a Zoom birthday party. <laughs> oh, great. After COVID. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the pandemic. Yeah, we we'll love we we'll love a bar. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We love a bar. That's more than that. Well, great. Okay. Yeah, Rod, As you know, with age, they get all sorts of things to remind you that you're getting on. So, and my my problem is hearing. Even with yeah. hearing aids, I have difficulty. Mm -hmm. Well, considering you did very well today. Oh, yes, I, I because. Well, thank you, you thank you. People, you remember Rod, I just sent you on the other run was really They've forgotten they were there, that we were dealing, but I realized they were there so, for so long. Rod, I just sent you what I think, so you all might like to. Thank you. Expand the net, and if you text me, I will text you back. All right, we'll do. Fantastic. If you need Thank any you. further explanations. Okay. You you did the family proud though. You did the family yeah, proud. Yeah, it was so fascinating.
fascinating. Yeah, I remember there is a Fran Deck. Oh my God. Yeah, going going up in the air. Yes, you're dressed to kill. You know, I've seen I this, know. Well, I thought some, you would all come and kill you. Um, yes. It's an Mr. outing. Mr. Mark, they'll get you. Somebody asked him about what, making tea with the CBD. He tiny must think about that. What is a CBD? CBD, is that with the CBD, marijuana? CBD, not let it only be in oil and rubs. Well, is that, is it, that's not the you hemp, is it? To, might be able to have a cup of tea with a few, a few drops of the, um, the CBD. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the or um, some, hemp, or some hemp of oil. The weed in the, or some of the hemp. weed in the tea leaves. Yeah, there you go. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> That'll give you a high for sure. <laughs> 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 Yeah, and, and that's not saying hello. There's another thing. <laughs> yeah. We can move from lemon. We can move from lemon grass tomorrow, Anna. There we go. All right. Uh, All right. Well, Out to your mouth. Out to your mouth. Lemon grass to lemon, lemon grass to lemon grass tomorrow, Anna. Okay. Yeah. Well, listen. We did enjoy it so much. Joyce, so we... it's so nice seeing you. Yeah. yeah, man. Yeah, it's so nice. Thank God for this. Uh, Thank God for these young people who are making life, yes, life uh, easy for us. They're not <laughs> aging at all. Yeah. Auntie Joyce has been with us from the very beginning, Jim. So we... we, uh, we so, oh, since she we, was a, okay, okay, okay. Since we started this venture... How long uh -huh. ago was it? How long ago was it, Rod? How long? Uh, 2017. And that's keeping you going. Seven, 19, Seven. what, 20 what? What time we start? What year we start? January. Jan January 2017. 2017, yeah, this is 21, yes. Well, in January, how old you will be? No. Pardon? Well, well, she is your age. And, uh, I, got and, well, three more. I got three more over you, Jem. You got three on the knee. Over. Over me. Okay, 93 okay. going on 94. All righty. <laughs> All That's righty. Joyce is showing off. I'm showing off. <laughs> I'm showing off. So then I, anyhow, I hope my faculty is the only two rate. They're all there. And it will keep me going for. Mm -hmm. What I love is that you all, you've always been an amazing dresser okay. and you look so gorgeous. <laughs> you know, this lockdown and so has got me with a different lifestyle, which I'm trying to get accustomed to. Yeah. And I must admit, I'm enjoying it, staying at home with my feet up. Uh, how, many time, how many times you walk up and down the house, you tell me? Uh, I Just didn't think I would reach to that stage. Okay. Yeah, Why where I stay at home because and just do... Just look at television and play with, play with these three gadgets. The computer, the laptop, the iPad, and the phone. Yeah. Well, it's keep... Drag kicking, the drag kicking and screaming into the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. We still be we still grateful. Yeah. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. We shall bye. bye again. Bye.